On last week's show, we talked with Dr. Lisa May about Lab Scrum, a way that graduate students and lab workers can learn from software development practices to foster better communication and teamwork to help their own projects move forward more efficiently. That reminded Dan and I about an episode we did back in 2016 about the possible benefits of team science. Academia can often be about individual achievement, but is that really what's best for scientific progress or even mental well-being? We thought it'd be fun to share this episode from several years ago with you once again. Uh, If you haven't listened to last week's interview with Dr. May, give that a listen first and then check out this discussion. Also, we'd like to thank our friends at Promega. Cloning your gene can be one of the biggest headaches of your project, but before you jump in, make sure you're using the best method for your gene and target locus. Need help deciding? Check out the cloning guides in the ProMega Student Resources Center for advice on choosing a method, as well as tips for making your experiment a success. You can visit promega.com slash hellophd to learn more. Also, we want to say thank you to our friends at BioBox. Research can move slowly, but you don't have to. Accelerate your research with BioBox Analytics. Analyze and explore your genomic data on demand with no coding skills required. You can sign up for free at biobox.io. And now, on with the show. This episode of Hello PhD is sponsored by Promega and listeners like you. Thanks for your support. I want a, I want a pipette bin that has, instead of microliters, you can turn it to a teaspoon, yeah. tablespoon. You've got this group of people around you to help you get through it in a real and meaningful way because they also are invested in that project moving forward. Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. Today on the show, we propose a fundamental change that will get your research done faster and with way less to spare. Stay with us. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 56. I'm Joshua Hall. And I'm Daniel Arneman. And we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Dan, you have your eerie zoo shirt on today. Yeah, I have had this shirt since 10th grade, and it, now uh, I'm how old? I should actually say eerie zoo staff. Yeah, I, I worked at the eerie zoo for oh, like a summer, maybe a year, um, in the gift shop and in the gate. Very exciting. Do you ever regret not going into a career of zookeeping? I didn't do any zookeeping. I really just gave people tickets, but but it was actually it was that was one of the highlights of working at the zoo. Is you get there before it gets so hot, that the animals are just sleeping all the time. Like lions roar in the morning, and I don't know. There's there's that's actually stuff cool. happening before people got there. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It gets really boring really fast when the sun comes up. One week we'll do an episode, secrets of the zoo. Sounds good to me. We'll we'll call somebody from the Erie Zoo. All right, Dan. This is a little different this week because you would not show me. The beer bottle from which you poured these uh, pint glasses in front of me. Yeah, I assumed that if I showed you the beer bottle, you would not allow me to have it on the show. So, uh, here you go. All right, this is exciting. Well, I can describe it. So, this is a little lighter color on the spectrum. I would say it's uh, a straw color. Okay, good. Um, let's, let's give it a taste. And while he's tasting, I will describe the faces he makes. Smoky. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely getting some smoke. Good. Um, I'm going to guess you, you took a Budweiser and you poured it out and then you lit a fire under it and yeah. let the smoke permeate it's it. It's a little bit bacony, us. isn't it? Yeah. I could, I could see bacon. Is this a bacon beer? It is not a bacon beer, but... Uh, but I'm, I assume I'm right on the smoke. You are right. correct on the smoke. This is part of the fall Samuel Adams pack. And this is why I knew you would never let me have a Sam Adams beer on the show. This is the Bonfire Blonde. Sounds pretty right. You were right on, man. Wow. Well, they certainly, uh, yeah. We we, I mean, we have been drinking beers that are like so regional <laughs> that I figured nobody would get them. So I brought you one that anybody should be able to get in the store. Well, this this certainly passes my test of a beer with a flavor in the title I want to be able to taste it in the beer. You <laughs> this are you, absolutely passes that test. Are you a fan of smoky flavors or not so much? I do. I mean, I love, I love smoked meats. Yeah, I smoked love smoked salmon. cheeses. Yep. Yeah, a so nice gouda. I'm, I'm not against this beer actually. After See, the I, that's initial, exactly how I felt. The first drink, you're like, I don't know about this. You know what's interesting about it is, uh, so I smelled it. I gave it a good, a good whiff before I took a drink, 
and I didn't pick up any smoke at all. I actually thought it was just uh, some American lager some that cheap you beer some, I brought over, yeah. some Miller High Life or something. And then the smoke just hits you in the face, yep. clobbers you. If you like smoke, go out and, and try it. That's pretty interesting. Dan, I've got some news at the top of the show, some science news okay. that I thought was pretty cool. The first is antibacterial soap. Is Love gonna, them, use them all the time. It is going the way of the dinosaur. Is it? It is about time. That's all I can say. Yeah, the microbiologist in me, and I tend to to hang out with the microbiology crowd, and we've been anti antibacterial soap people for a while. Because what people don't realize that I try to tell them all the time is, you know, what else is antibiotic? Soap. Yes. Yeah, just turns, soap. <laughs> turns out, turns out that can break down a, a cell membrane just as well as anything else. So apparently, the FDA finally made a ruling just this past Friday on um, antibacterial soap, and they're pulling it from the market. So we're not going to even see it around anymore. And, you know, the reason for this, the reason people get antibacterial soap, obviously, is they want to control the microbes on their skin. But the soap itself does a pretty good job of that. But the addition of these these chemicals traditionally used in these soaps tends to disrupt your natural flora, your natural microbiome, and also contributes to the rise of antibiotic resistance strains. Yeah, it's a nightmare all around. It gets into waterways. It gets everywhere. So the other thing I came across that I wanted to get your uh, opinion on, Dan, or at least if you're aware of, are you familiar with Hitchbot? I am not. I have not heard of this. So Hitchbot is a hitchhiking robot from Canada created by two scientists, David Harris-Smith of McMaster University and Frank Kozeller of Ryerson University, both in Canada. And Hitchbot, let me see if I can pull a picture up of this guy. So we'll post this. So there's Hitchbot. He's got this sort of iPad-looking face. It's sort of like if you put an iPad in a in a trash can or in a kerosene heater. It's like R2-D2 got a clear face screen. Yeah, yeah. And he's a very friendly-looking guy, I would uh, think. The, the ominous red eyes and <laughs> creepy smile don't help. But yeah, okay. Well so, well, so one of the goals of Hitchbot was to see if Hitchbot, due to the kindness of, of strangers, could hitchhike all the way across Canada... Uh, and so people would... Okay, and, I believe this could work in Canada. I'm not sure it would work here. Well, so Hitchbot successfully hitchhiked all the way across Canada. I should mention Hitch, Hitchbot, sort of like Siri, has some primitive artificial intelligence and can respond to basic questions, but he's not mobile at all. So, you know, you would pick up Hitchbot on the side of the road, take him as far as you want, and I guess Hitchbot could tell you sort of where he was trying to get to, uh, and then you would set him down and hopefully someone else would pick him up. So he made news when he successfully hitchhiked across Canada in 2015, and so they expanded their project, and he hitchhiked across the Netherlands, across Germany, and then they they decided, well, let's see if we can get him to hitchhike across the U.S. He was instantly mugged and <laughs> taken for scrap. Well, the goal was to get him from Boston to San Francisco. No chance. But I hate to say it, on August 1st, 2015, he met a sudden end in Philadelphia, Wow, he made it really far. Did uh, when you bring him to America, he's going to need a concealed carry permit. <laughs> I just thought like that's so us, right? Like he made it across Canada, he made it across the Netherlands, made it across Germany. This is why we don't have nice things. He made it a fourth way across America, and then he got he got axed. What happened? Somebody just well. So I have a photograph. Oh, I don't want to see. And it. I know you have a weak stomach, Dan. Do you want to see this? This is it is just a robot, right? From the crime scene. There's Hitchbot. Oh, come on, people. Uh, yeah, we'll. We'll post a link to this. We won't post the photo, but... It's just like a robot that's yeah, on the side of the yeah, road. Yeah. Hitchbot was, was, was killed in the United States. So anyway, his creators are gearing up. They're trying again. Um, and apparently Hitchbot was quoted saying that, My trip must come to an end for now, but my love for humans will never fade. Thanks, friends. Also, I'll be back. <laughs> Anyway, Dan, let's uh, let's move on from our science. In not, the I'm news. not sure that was science related in any way, shape, or form. Scientists, they made a robot. Okay, that hitchhiked across the country. That's pretty neat. Be honest, you would have rather worked it's the on that project. Hard-hitting science journalism that you've come to expect from Hello PhD. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so what we want to do today is the final, the third and final segment of our modern PhD series. So, for those of you who maybe missed the last two episodes. We've really been talking about ways to take PhD training that's largely been unchanged for, for many years, and is there a way we can change it to make it more relevant for 
current day for modern times it'd be difficult to make it less relevant for modern times <laughs> well maybe that's episode four in the series maybe so 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 to recap in week one i laid out my idea for the five-year phd and then last week we talked a little bit about the importance of that advisor student relationship and ways we can polish and nurture that relationship to to improve training for graduate students but today, I'm really excited to talk about this one. So we're going to talk today about changing the structure of graduate training into a more team science format. And, and we've joked that team science sounds like a superhero squad. In my mind, I'm picturing, you know what LARPers are? Oh, those people who dress up. Live action and, role playing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just picturing a, a team of scientists, each in their costumes, like throwing lightning bolts at each other. Thing, did you ever watch Captain Planet? Oh, yeah, I watched Kevin Planet. Of course. It'd be like, Western blood, PCR. There it is. <laughs> By your powers <laughs> combined, yeah. Team science. Um, okay, so... Nobody under the age of 37 knows what uh, that, that is. That's, that's, probably, that's, that's probably true. All right, so what I mean by team science is that, well, I guess first backing up, the way that, that most graduate projects, most graduate training works now, as I'm sure our listeners are acutely aware, and as was true for us, Dan, you start your PhD program, you choose a lab, and then you're assigned a project within that lab. And, and maybe you choose your lab based on the project that, that you're likely going to get assigned. Yeah, this is, this is um, in that old Western film where the, the two guys walk out into the middle of the street and everybody clears the way. And they're just like, it's you versus your project. You're all alone out there. Nobody, that, nobody's there to help you. And, and no one's going to back you up. So No, that's very true. And, and that's sort of a hallmark of... PhD training in the sciences is you've got your project, and really, you and you alone are responsible for carrying that project across the finish line, generating a few papers based on that project, first author papers, progressing that project enough that your committee says, okay, you've done enough for a PhD. And so, I guess my argument is, maybe that's not the best way to do things from the perspective of the trainee. That's not the best way to do things from the perspective of science actually <laughs> moving forward. And also that might not even be in the best interest of the labs, of the individual PIs. Uh, or the people providing the, the funding. or the, Yeah, if you've got a proposal that can get us to faster results, uh, better training and, and better skill development, and less burnout, then I'm interested in hearing your thoughts. Yeah, and so I think I think the funding agencies are already onto this notion a little bit, maybe not from the perspective of individual graduate students, but one of the things that that funding agencies and I'll use NIH as our example are starting to do more and more of are these funding opportunities, these grants called program grants or center grants. Have you heard of these at all, Dan? I have not. So so what these are is these are grants that aren't necessarily awarded to a specific lab or specific PI, but are actually awarded to multiple PIs, often at multiple sites. And the idea is that different individuals, different labs bring different expertises to the table, and together they can actually accomplish much more than they could individually. Team. Together, everyone achieves more. <laughs> there you go. There, there goes my corporate BS alert. <laughs> well, I pulled this from the NIH website about this program project grant category called the PO1. So you might be familiar with the RO1. Which I is have heard of the RO1. Kind of like the gold standard uh, to which you uh, strive to obtain if you're a, a faculty member. But the PO1, the program project grant PO1, is more complex in scope and budget than the individual research grant. While individual research grants are awarded to support the work of one principal investigator who, with supporting staff, is addressing a scientific problem, program project grants are available to a group of several investigators with differing areas of expertise who wish to collaborate and research by pooling their talents and resources. Program project grants represent synergistic research programs that are designed to achieve results not attainable by investigators working independently. Well, that was a mouthful. Now, this is, what you talked about is labs in different locations. Presumably, these are not two cytoskeleton labs, but it's like a cytoskeleton lab and a protein chemistry lab and a clinical research lab all working together on some problem. Sure. And actually, I was just having a conversation this week with a friend of mine working in a lab, and they're working on putting in a proposal for one of these types of grants. And so their lab has a lot of experience doing mouse work, right? So they're doing this, the mouse work part of the grant. 
There's another lab that's a biochemistry lab that's doing all the biochemistry part. Then there's a third group that does bioinformatics, and they're doing a lot of the bioinformatics analysis. Okay, that's a that's a nice mix. Um, what if you are a graduate student in one of these labs? Do you get to publish papers? Do you get to do research, or do you does does some like overlord for the project assign you gels to run, and you just go run them? Well, here's the thing. I, whereas I think these grants are beneficial for the labs themselves, obviously the funding, and are beneficial for the funding agency in that more science gets done more efficiently. I don't know that this necessarily fundamentally changes the individual graduate student experience. Well, do they do they assign graduate students to these projects, or do they give it to a postdoc or to a technician? I think it's it could happen. It could be part of a graduate student's project, or maybe it's assigned to a a technician just to run sort of this aspect. Stop of the working project. on your, your dissertation work and go run this gel for this PL one, basically. Yeah, and you know, as a graduate student, in the way things go now, you probably wouldn't want your entire project to be based on this program grant because chances are your your likelihood of getting a first author publication might be diminished because your lab's contribution is just a fraction of the total work. Yeah, and in large collaborations like this, oftentimes the PI will be the first author and the last author. A PI from one lab will be the first author, a PI from a different lab will be the last author, and everybody kind of fits yeah, in the middle. Yeah, that, that is certainly possible. And so I guess what I argue is what would it be like if just the structure of graduate training and the structure of labs in academic settings had more of a team approach and less of this everybody on an individual project approach. And so when we think about the way things are done now, as we were, as we were highlighting, you know, that's really one of the, the hallmarks that's touted for PhD training in general is you, you gain this independence. You learn to work independently to solve a problem and to figure out solutions. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps <laughs> and it's the American dream. Wouldn't you agree, Dad? I mean, that was always something to strive for is I'm trying to become a more independent scientist. I think that's true, yeah. Um, although I do always caution students when we say independent, there's a difference between independence and isolation. And so I think a lot of students in their quest for independence tack too far to the right and think like, well, I have to do it all on my own. Yeah, I should never ask for help, never ask a question, Yeah, never have anybody look at my results. And even in today's <laughs> setting, that's not what you should be doing. But, you know, right now, ultimately, it's your project, and you end up doing most of it. And you do that because you're trying to gain independence, but also you need those first author papers to get out and to move on with your career. But what if instead you enter a lab, and it's set up in this team approach, and let's say you have a lot of interest or expertise in doing biochemistry. It's a great example. I don't, but go on. <laughs> um, and let's say, you know, your pro the project in the lab that maybe typically a grad student would be assigned had some biochemistry, had some animal work, had some genetics, had some bioinformatics. What if instead of you having to figure all that stuff out at some point, what if you got the biochemistry part and then someone who was really interested in bioinformatics did that part. And then the person who really enjoyed animal work did that part. And you all worked together as a team based on your skills and interests on these individual projects. And who knows, maybe you have three different projects you're working on, but your piece is something you are much more interested in and comfortable with doing. Yeah. As you know, Josh, I strongly, strongly advocate for finding the skills you love to use and finding a way to use them more because you lose track of time and uh, you will be recognized for being good at those things because you actually like doing them. Um, this strikes me as a way to to maximize that, to actually figure out, I love doing protein biochemistry. Why can't I do that more rather than having to go to the mouse facility and I'm doing all of this work that really doesn't satisfy me? I'm probably not doing it as well as somebody else who does like it. And it's just like draining me emotionally. Absolutely, Dan. Let's just go through, I was jotting down some pros and cons to changing graduate education to this team project model from the independent project model. All right. And first I'll say, I actually knew a, a faculty member who arranges his lab in this way. So you actually go into his lab and the first thing you see, it's pretty interesting, is there are these tables arranged into a circle. It's, well, actually, it's this big circular table. It looks like pie pieces and every King arthur is there <laughs> that's sort of what it looks like yeah. but everybody's computer their computers kind of around monitors around the the periphery and everyone's desk is right there in the middle of the lab at these computers and 
Nobody's on Facebook then. <laughs> I guess not. Maybe yeah, that's, that's why the they design, did design, yeah. Um, but, you know, I was talking to him, and the reason he does that is he doesn't want people to be isolated. He wants them to be talking to each other, working together, problem-solving together. Um, and some of the ways he arranges projects is, is similar to this. He's a very successful scientist, so maybe there's some precedents for this. So if you know a lab that's doing this, let us know. All right, so, so some of the pros, I think, for doing this, some of the positives are, one... I think science would get done faster. Now, explain how it would get done faster. Okay, Dan. Well, you mentioned you like doing protein biochemistry. And let's say that was a skill that you had. You had a knack for it. Um, And, you know, you've been in labs. I think molecular cloning is a good example. (laughs) You know, there's some people that seem to have these magical hands for doing DNA cloning and other people that just bang their head against the wall, right? Most projects have multiple facets to them, right? And require true. different techniques and different um, ways of doing things. Well, what if each of those facets of the project were actually being worked on by someone who was skilled and interested in actually doing that part? Yeah, I, I mean, that makes sense. It's it's not just the, if I'm good at this, maybe I make fewer mistakes and don't have to replicate it so many times. But it's also the learning curve to figure out the technique. I mean, I got really good at doing live cell microscopy. And it took, it took a while to get to that point, but um, why make everybody in the lab get to that level when I could probably run it in a fifth the time that it took somebody new? Oh, yeah. Like, I remember being in a lab, and this individual in the lab had really completed five-sixths of the work that needed to be done to get this publication out. And it was decided that this person needed to do an IMSA. Do you know what an IMSA is? Electrophoretic Mobility Shift Assay. Sounds like fun. She'd never done this before right. or anything even similar to this. But this experiment was standing in the way of the publication. It needed to be done. I don't know if the publication ever went out. I assume it probably did. But basically, you know, she was moving right along, making a lot of progress, and then suddenly had to stop and try to figure out how the heck to do this assay using these totally different skills. And the whole rest of the paper, you know, was like genetic stuff and all this different stuff. And then she had to suddenly figure out how to purify these proteins, and that was not her expertise or anything she'd ever done before. So, like, the whole thing kind of grinded to a halt because of this one assay she needed to do that she wasn't skilled to that do. That somebody else probably would have been just fine at. And right, the there's somebody else invalid, in the lab yeah. who had done this a dozen times, right? Yeah. Now, my my one caveat here is when I I totally agree with you. I think you can maximize the efficiency by getting people to do the things they like doing and that they're good at. When you work as a team, though, there are handoffs. And so I feel like at this juncture, planning becomes super important in communication. And I can imagine losing some time on both coordinating those things. And then when somebody drops the ball, like I'm waiting on Jim to finish his assay because I can't do my part until you haven't finished your your clone yet. So I can't grow it up in these bacteria to express it, whatever it is. No, you're absolutely right. And and in a lot of ways, Dan, that tension leads into another one of my, my pros for, for this way of doing science. And that is, first of all, it's much more realistic to the real world outside of academia. Dan, I know you work in an in industry, in a team setting. Yeah, in- yeah, I work in a, in a software company. And I've been thinking about this, this topic this week about how in my team, everybody kind of has a specific role. It's not that everybody couldn't do the jobs of everybody else. I mean, I couldn't do all their jobs, but that's fine. But there are people with specialties and, and with interest in certain aspects of the software development. Somebody really wants to do the scientific computing to do the, the hard algorithms and the mathematics. Somebody else is great at structuring the database so that the data can come out really quickly. And somebody else is really great at building the the visuals on the front end so that a user on the web can get to it. Certainly, those people could be doing the other things, but they don't want to. They want to do their niche. And then it's all the handoffs that happen that that make us work together. And I imagine they were hired because they showed proficiency in doing those things. Yeah, a generalist is great. And, and uh, I think... Having the ability to to jump around as we need them is useful, in particularly in a startup setting. But certainly, we didn't just go say hire anybody off the street that can write write code. I mean, we were looking for people who had skills in these specific areas. Yeah, and it would be kind of odd to say, okay, well, Jim, you're on product A, and Susie, you're on product B, and so basically, what you need to do is yeah, do all build the, the entire stack <laughs> first, do, do the yeah. programming, and then figure yeah. out the database. And then I need you to market it, and then yep. acquire uh, exactly funding right, for yeah. it. And then, 
it wouldn't make sense at all. Yeah, you'd be done um, immediately. But that's how we do projects in, in graduate school, right? Um, but then the other thing I want to say, Dan, is first of all, I think building these skills of working inside of a team structure is going to be better preparation for whatever you're doing after graduate school. But the other thing is, I think it adds a layer of accountability that's not necessarily there under the current structure. So as we know, let's say you made your, your clone and you need to like put it into bacteria or whatever. And yeah, I don't really feel like it today. Yeah, it's lunchtime. Yeah, I mean, you're the only one yeah. that it really matters to, right? Days go by, years go by. Yeah, but if you knew, oh, well, Josh is waiting on that construct because he wants to go ahead and get protein made, you would be a little more motivated to do that in a timely manner, right? Yeah, and, and it becomes really obvious when things fall through the cracks. So we use a, a planning process called Scrum or Agile, which you may have heard of and we should probably do a show on because I think it would apply to science. But we have tickets and these tickets move through a process. And when things start backing up at some level, so if the, the guy who's developing the website, if the tickets start to pile up in his bin because we know he needs to work on them, we all both notice and, and we find out, have we been assigning too much? Is he getting behind because of something else? Or can we all pitch in and get some of these things through that, that bottleneck? And so when it does have to go through all of these different people, it's really obvious when somebody needs help or if they've gotten demotivated or if they're just like stuck because we piled too much on and now we need more resources to give them. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And that actually goes to my last pro, which is by having a team approach, you make the whole process way fewer opportunities for demotivation and for despair. And it went at the top of the show, you know, we said sort of in a funny way, get your project done with less despair. But I think that's actually true because if you think about the current model, inevitably you will hit snag or snags, right? And with the independent project model, kind of alone with that. I mean, certainly you can and should reach out and people will be there to help you. But ultimately it's your project, right? And them helping you is them taking time away from the dozen things that they're working on. Um, at the end of the day, you have to troubleshoot it all kind of on your own. Yeah, if, if this PCR doesn't work and it doesn't work for two or three days in a row and there are people watching the process and they need that, I think, Josh, I would let you check my primers and I would let you try and, and run it. And maybe we'd go get TAC from down the hall to, to do it because we need this thing done. Um, we would notice it immediately. We wouldn't lose a week or a month like trying to repeat it over and over. Yeah, and absolutely. And I think what I always imagine, this is sort of, this is the, the image that I get of, of doing science in this team way. And it's a lot of what, like what you said. Yeah, let's say I do have a, a PCR step that's really... We can both do it. Maybe I'm better sure, at it. But sure, Yeah. And I'm imagining what happens is, okay, you know, I've tried this a couple times. Since we're all a team working together on the same project and are invested in the same set of experiments, we call a meeting and we all come together and I lay out, here's what I'm doing. Here are all the pieces. You guys are familiar with the project. And not just familiar, because, you know, you could say, well, you, you could do this in lab meeting. You could say, well, I'm having trouble with this PCR. But it's totally different. And you know, Dan, you've probably had people in your lab who are like, oh, yeah, I'm stuck on this, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't care. I've got my own problems. <laughs> yeah, you're interested. And you're willing to help to a no, certain degree. Not. But if you could come together in this setting where everybody's like, okay, let's brainstorm this. Exactly what you said. Yeah, let's we figure all it have out to together. Get this done. Yeah. And think about what that would be like as a grad student, knowing that when those inevitable challenges do arise, you've got this group of people around you to help you get through it in a real and meaningful way because they also are invested in that project moving forward. Well, and what sometimes can come out of that, and, and, and I experienced this at work, I get to an impasse and I say, I can't go this way because it'll break because of, you know, in, in this way. And I can't go that way because it'll break. And I have run out of ideas on, on making a path forward. So maybe my PCR doesn't work and I've tried all these things and it just doesn't work. Other people can have a different, you know, they're, they're sort of outside of the problem sometimes, but they care because they also want this thing to move forward. They might say, well, let's scrap that part and go do this other thing. Let's do a different construct or let's not put that figure in the paper because we actually don't think it's going to help that much. And now that we see that it's not easy, we'll just move on to this other part of the project. Or maybe we'll come back. Anyways, you can have those conversations that totally change the course of the project um, when you hit a roadblock and everybody is in it together, kind of. Absolutely. And I think in general, that would just make the whole process more fun and engaging. 
So, so some of the cons, uh, I think we've laid out yeah. the good parts. That was the fun and engaging part of the show. Now, where does it break? So here's a few things I thought about. So maybe a drawback could be that you learn fewer techniques. You learn fewer new things, right? So one advantage to the current independent project model is, you know, because really all the facets of the project are ultimately on you, you are going to have to learn a lot of different things on your own that maybe you wouldn't have to in this team approach. Yeah, this is a bit of a danger to me. It seems important that everybody understands how the experiments are working and and the techniques behind them. So I, I don't ever want to see a situation where just because it's not your job to do the PCRs, you don't know how PCR works. Mm-hmm. That seems dangerous to me. But certainly you can understand how PCR works and just not have the best hands for pipetting or maybe you contaminate things with RNAs and somebody else doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, you should learn how to do it but and you should understand how it works, but maybe you're just not the best at it. Yeah, that's true. And I could imagine even in like committee meeting situations, you're still responsible for the understanding of the complete project, even if you know you day in and day out aren't the ones technically doing that. And I thought about it too, the majority of us who transition out of graduate training, how much of us really are relying on the technical skills we got as a graduate student once we leave graduate school? I have not pipetted in years. <laughs> well, I miss go. it. Yeah, do you? No. I want it for my kitchen. <laughs> We've talked about that before. That's true. You I want a I want a pipetman that has instead of microliters, you can turn it to a teaspoon, yeah. tablespoon. Half I want teaspoon. I want microliters. I don't want teaspoons and tablespoons. Yeah, you're such a precision guy. That's probably good. Um so another con is you know, imagine working as a team, your likelihood to get those first author papers is going to go down. It's not going to happen. In fact, you know, it would probably require more of a a broader culture shift in certainly graduation requirements because you would probably have more situations where you'd have more multi-author papers where, you know, I could even imagine more papers where you've got four or five co-first authors together, or maybe you'd have more second and third author papers, which I guess would be okay if you didn't go into a tenure track faculty career path. Because a lot of other careers, I mean, I imagine when you were hired, they didn't ask you What's your publication record like, Dan? They did not ask me. And even if I had posted it, they wouldn't have known what it meant or cared, probably. Yeah, so I guess that's that's only one caveat, especially if you move on in, in academic science. That That's really all I thought of <laughs> as far as, as negatives. But, I mean, that would have to, the, the first author requirement would have to change. I, I don't know who would be the first author in that team approach. Typically, the PI is the last author. If you're doing a team approach, uh, I just don't know how you'd pick. Well, you know, I mean, there are co-first author. That is a, a situation that happens. You know, you read the papers yeah. and they all have the little star by their name. A these... thousand first authors, yeah. yeah I mean, but somebody's have... name still comes first. Well, that's true. There's always that. Somebody at all. That's, uh, you got to pick. Maybe you switch that around. I don't know. It would require a little bit of a culture shift. But again, that's the whole thing we're talking about. Looking back, I can imagine that would be a much more engaging environment to work in. And I could almost see myself enjoying going back and working in a situation like that compared to what it was actually like going through it. Well, you you forgot one major con that I'm sure somebody's going to bring up if we don't mention it. Yeah, what's that? Which is the fear of the lazy person. So you you did team projects in high school and college (laughs) and whatever. And there was... It was probably you. Who knows? There was always that one guy who did all the work. And then there was always the person who's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get that over to you. Don't worry about it. And then at 2 a.m. you end up writing it yourself because that guy never actually got you the part of the project. And that guy was you. That was me. Yep. <laughs> Playing video games. Leave me alone. I guess. But, but yeah. so, so what happens here? And, and in an industrial setting, that person doesn't last very long. But in a university setting, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't have an answer for that. I guess my hope would be the accountability would help them proceed, but it would certainly require PIs to be more engaged leaders of their research team. I think. Yeah, I think, I think that's fair. They, they would have to do that personnel thing because it's not everybody working individually anymore. That's something that happens now. I know I've seen situations where some of the most frustrated I've seen lab members be at their their advisor is when there is somebody not pulling their weight in the lab and the PI is not addressing it. Like that can be very frustrating, even in the current situation. Yeah. I think I love the idea. I love the approach of a team. Um, I think it will succeed or fail in the management and the planning It's not going to happen organically and all by itself. And it 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 does take effort. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there and I think we should try it or, or hear from people who have tried it. Yeah. And I just imagine what would that experience be like? What would, 
what are the skills you would learn if you went through a five-year process of doing science in a team, learning to work together, learning to plan, learning to see a project through, not just by yourself, but with other people? Um, I don't know. What would that do to your psyche, but also to your career prospects afterwards? If, if this sounds like you or this sounds like your lab, you're in one of these uh, environments where you are working as a team, people have divided up the labor, people are doing the thing that they love and that they're good at. Will you please write to us? We would love to talk to you, uh, interview you for the show, or just hear about how it works so that it's out of the theoretical world and into the real world and find out how it how it succeeds and how it fails. Yeah, we would definitely love to hear that. Please write in. All right, Dan, etymology puzzle. You ready for it? The ready. clue last week was two weeks ago, the first sheet I glued into my manuscript was this step-by-step description of how to repeat the experiment. I think I know this one. Okay, let's hear it. I'm going to guess protocol. It is the protocol. Originally from the Greek, protos. You probably know proto. means first. And kala, which is glue, which is a little bit of an odd way to describe a protocol. But in the Greek, it was originally meant to be the first sheet glued into a manuscript. So um, as it progressed from, from Greek to the Roman times, this first sheet of paper that went into the manuscript had the, the kind of table of contents and errata were written in it. Um, and that came through French. And, and in the 1540s, the protocol meant a draft document. It doesn't mean exactly the same thing now. A protocol is like, here's how we do things. But it evolved into that meaning later and, and much more recently. So protocol, first glue. Interesting now that in some of the big science journals, the methods and the protocols now are being shoved to the back and yeah, even into supplemental the you know, materials. That's kind of interesting. We should call them up on an etymological so Don't you falsehood. know what this yes. means? <laughs> well, what's the word for end or last instead of first? I wonder. We'll come up with it and make a new thing. The opposite of proto. Yeah. Yeah. The last clue. All right, Josh, let me read you the clue for next time. All right. If there was one of these, yo, I'll solve it. Just throw it forward while my DJ revolves it. Do I need to read that again? I doubt it. I would love to hear you read okay. that again, actually. If there was one of these, yo, I'll solve it. Just throw it forward while my DJ revolves it. Remember, I'm looking for a scientific word described by the clue, and once you get it, you'll find that the literal meaning of that science word is a phrase in the clue itself. If you think you know the answer, email it to puzzle at hellophd.com, and we'll randomly select a winner from all the correct responses and send the lucky puzzler an Amazon gift card. I think you probably already know, don't you, Josh? I'm still thinking about this one. Okay. We'll work it out for next week and uh, enjoy some smoky beer. Yeah, thanks for bringing this. I'm, I'm liking it. The more I drink it, it's uh, it's pretty good. Doesn't beer have a way of the more you drink it, the more you like it? Well, that's probably true. If you get this, make sure you don't tell your friend what it is before they take a drink. <laughs> yeah, it's. I thought it was kind of a bold move for Sam Adams to, to make something this dramatic and to stick it into the pack of other fall beers. Oh, yeah, definitely. All right, Dan, well... This has been a great show. If you have feedback on this show, we'd love to hear it. Or if you've got an idea for a future show, let us know. You can email us, podcast at hellophd.com. You can tweet at us at hellophd or contact us on the Facebook page. All right, Josh, we'll see you next time. See you next time. (coughs) Go for it. Welcome to Hello PhD a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. Today on the show, we propose a fundamental change that will get your research... (laughs) So to recap, in week one, we talked a little bit about... I actually don't remember what we talked about. (laughs) What was the first week? 